My coverage of Computex 2017 is brought to you by MSI, EVGA, Tesoro, G-Skill, and Cooler Master. All right, guys, I'm over here at uh, Nangang, and I'm at the G-Skill booth, where they have the uh, World Series of Overclocking stage over here, which is behind me. But uh, they've actually offered to allow me to do some hardcore overclocking here. And we're going to see if we can overclock a 7700K to uh, 7, 7 gigahertz yeah. is what we're aiming for. Um, now I've never done this, and I, I fully admit this. I've, I've shown you guys overclocking like this before, but I've never tried it myself. So um, we got some LN2 here. Cheers. Cheers. Uh, so <laughs> no, you're not supposed to drink this stuff. Uh, so what, what's, what's the basic idea here? We, we have a, a pot, as it is known, yeah. which is made of all copper, I imagine. Yeah, Nickel plated. Yeah. And um, this is what sits on top of the CPU. Uh, you're also delitting the CPUs, right? So the CPUs have been delitted. The uh, crappy thermal paste that Intel used, uses has been replaced by something much higher quality. Lid goes back on, more thermal paste. Pot sits on top of it. Uh, it's actually got a little gap here for thermistor to drop in there to measure temperature. Um, and, and that's all I know so far. So uh, that's uh, all you need to know before right. you start pouring in. That's Pretty the basic point. It, man. Well, good. So this is the pot that's being used right here. Yeah, correct. Uh, right now we have a 7700K, which is at 5500 megahertz, uh, which is uh, running at a, a voltage 1.17. Which is uh, that's actually a pretty good overclock, right? It's, uh, it's right 1.6. Like it's reading out. Oh, 1.6. Yeah. Oh, because when you do this, like you can't trust CPU Z. <laughs> CPU Z is not trustworthy. So we're actually at 1.6 right now. So that makes a little bit more sense. I was like, wow, if you hit 5.5 at 1.17 volts, that is a very nice chip right there. <laughs> All right, so, um, so what, now we just pour liquid nitrogen. So the, yeah, if, if we want to get it to seven gigahertz, the first thing we have to do is drop down the temperature to about minus one hundred and ninety degrees centigrade. We call this okay. full pot because we can just keep on pouring and we reach, we reach the lowest temperature possible uh, with with the liquid nitrogen. Okay, and we're so, at we're at one eighteen minus one eighteen right now. Um, so just I, I just get to start pouring. Yeah. Pour All right, here we go. Essentially, you start off with that massive plume of of uh, smoke coming out. And once it goes full pot, the liquid nitrogen just starts to simmer okay. rather than violently bubbling. All right, because the what is the what is the boiling temperature of liquid nitrogen? Um, it's uh, minus one hundred ninety-six degrees centigrade. Okay, so right now we are above that, which is why it's all vaporizing. I just pour. Should I just pour it all in? Yeah, just to make sure that you don't over pour, so it's like uh, not over. Oh yeah, we don't want to get it over onto the onto the motherboard or the PCB or or our G skill memory. Some other CPUs do have a cold look, and then you have to manage the temperature very accurately. So okay. here we could just pour in until we got the lowest temperature. With other CPUs, we have to very carefully control the temperature. Okay. Uh, it, it makes it easier in one way, but also a bit more difficult in the other way, because the thermal paste, not all thermal paste can withstand this kind of a cold temperature. Okay. And once in a while, we could have something that we call thermal paste cracking. And that's basically when the thermal paste solidifies and then loses the contact between either the CPU die and the heat spreader or the heat spreader and the CPU pot. Okay, so having accurate thermal readings is what's going to allow you to see like if yeah. you've lost your, your the, the good thermal paste contact there, then you got to pull it out. All I, out ideally, you would have, uh, you would have a, a, therm a thermal couple in the, in the CPU base and okay. one right next to the heat spreader as well. Okay. So you can see when you run a workload, if the CPU die temperature goes up a lot, but your CPU pot is stable, then you have a problem. That's when your your delta separates too far. Okay. So when you have a, a high delta, you know that you've, you've actually hit a crack. All right, uh, so right now we're down to minus 192.4-ish. Uh, what would be our next step? Uh, we have to increase the voltage to sustain a high frequency. Okay. Right? So we're at 1.6 right now, and for the first step until 6.5 gigahertz, we can use 1.85. Okay, so just uh, punch that in. Yeah, there you go. There we go, apply. Oops. Yep, there we go. And then we go to the CPU ratio. Alrighty. Wait, where's the ratio? Uh, ah. And then Let's enable another tab. Enable the group tuning so all the cores are enabled. Oh yeah, we're running four core eight thread by the way. We're not oh, okay. disabling any of the cores or hyper threading. Oh nice. So fifty five we can go, let's say, to six gigahertz. Alright. Uh, we now have six gigahertz represented in CPU Z uh, at one point eight five five volts. Uh, so things are looking good. So oh. now would we cool it down more or just kinda keep bumping up the 
we're, we're all good with the cable leak. We're at all the right. lowest point that we can go. Okay. So we have no thermal cracking. The voltage seems all right. We can just increase the frequency even more. All right, so bump up to say 6.5 or just go straight for 7? 6.2. 6.2. Six six two. Six two. We have to take small, small steps. Right, small baby steps. steps. If you a little go bit too time. quickly, like if you go too far too quickly, you, you end up tripping over yourself. I see. All right, so keep things warm. All right, we got 6.2. All right. Now Beautiful. We might go six four now. All right. How long do you like? Do you give it some time? You're like six two. It let it rest. It depends. There's a there's a, a strategies where you would leave it for a bit. So if you leave it for a bit and there is no load on the CPU, your CPU die will go slightly down in temperature. Okay. So maybe you can get like that ten extra megahertz or something like that. All right. So it's All right. six point four. All right. Four let's prepare. Four. Let's prepare for seven gigahertz. We have to increase the CPU core voltage to one point ninety three approximately. All right. Oh. Also, pay attention to the temperature, right? So we have to pour in again to make sure we're, we're at minus 192. So we ran out of LN2. The temperature's starting to creep up a little bit. We're at 185. So we got to dump in some more. And since I'm in charge of this, I got to do it. That's right. it. That's it. So you have to manage everything. You have to be on top of the temperature. You have to be on top of the voltages, the, the multipliers. Everything's all shifting at once. It's all active. All right. So uh, we're back down to 193 here. So uh, let's jump up to. Uh, you said 192 on the voltage? Uh, yeah, 925. 925, all right. 1.925 volts apply. All right. Beautiful. All right, 193 and is where we, we can, got the reading at. We can jump up to, let's say, 6.7, and okay. then just one ratio up at a time to okay. see, to gradually get to 7 gigahertz. All right, so we hit apply at 6.7. Uh, all right, we bumped up to 6.8 now, 6.8. Let's hit 6.9. Apply, my, my heart rate is increasing. Feel the pressure. All right, we got six, six point nine. Oh, it kind of crept up there too. Can, does, does that usually happen? Yeah, yeah. So there's oh, well, always going to be a just slight just fluctuation. Bounce a little bit back and forth. Based on the uh, uh, base clock. Okay, base clock is is fluctuating by about two, two or three hundredths of a megahertz. All right, let's uh, jump up to seven. Why not? Awesome. There we Good go. Seven. All right, I'm going to pour. I'm going to pour in more Ellen too. You want to try a bit yeah. high, higher. Now we have to take even smaller steps, so we just start going up with the BCLK frequency, okay. like 0 0.2 megahertz at a time. All right. Just same process. Oh yeah. There and, we go. And keep in mind, it's also a retail chip. It's not an engineering sample or anything. This like is, so this is this is you could do this at home basically, with a retail chip. You just got to get all this other. You you need a bunch of LN2, and that stuff. All right. Uh, temperature's still looking good. We're still at minus 193. We're at 7.0. Three gigahertz. That's that's pretty good. No, I'm gonna go for it. I'm gonna go 100.6 on the base clock. Oh, there we go. 7,042. I think our temperature is dropping just ever so slightly. And that's it. You got to stay on top of things, and, and yeah. that's where you're actively thinking of what's needed. See, well, I feel can, like if you can get over 70, 70, you're gonna be the fastest YouTuber that we've had at our booth. Oh damn! All right, I gotta do that. <laughs> no pressure. I gotta be. Who else has been here? Uh, we had the guys over from uh, Gamer Nexus. Uh, oh, Steve. Uh, yeah. I hate Steve. <laughs> Bill Line is over as well. All right, I got seven zero six. Seven. Well, that was almost seventy seventy. I'm at one hundred point nine. Let's go one hundred one. 101, we have 7070, 7070.07, which I think is very lucky. That's a very lucky number right there, right? Nice. You can increase a little bit the voltage to like 1.955. All right, let's do 55. Let's see if we can hit 7.1. Okay. Hit and apply. Temperature up. I'm going to add some more LN2. That's it. I am a hardcore overclocker. You're extreme, man. I'm <laughs> so extreme. <laughs> the capital X. All right. Uh, all right, let's let's bump the base clock up another point two here. One one point two on the base clock. Ah, oh, oh, memory read access violation. I'm gonna call it though that I won. I beat Steve and uh, Linus. It was Jay here. Uh, no, not all yet. Right, Jay didn't. No, uh, he's already gone back home. All right, I beat Steve and Linus by point seven zero uh, uh, megahertz on uh, the LN2 overclocking with the 7700K. So champion. Uh, so I win. Thank you. Well Thank done. you. Congrats, Everyone, man. everyone, go comments. Uh, and then we finally got our blue screen too, so uh, <laughs> we've come full circle. All right, thanks you guys. Uh, I think we should also probably check out some of the hardware that G Skill has on display here. So uh, I've heard they have memory. 
Let's start off with some G skill memory. They have it all lined up here, so I'm gonna kind of run down the line and show you guys each kit and what they have it set to. These are all X299, new, newest Intel platform for X series CPUs. Uh, this is a 16 gig kit running at 4,500 megahertz. What we're looking at right now is Trident Z non-RGB kits. Remember with RGB, you have to have some uh, extra data that's traveling over the bus uh, between the memory and the rest of the system, which means with RGB memory, they're not gonna hit, be able to hit quite as high frequencies and speeds. Here's another 8 gig by 2 kit, also running at 4,500 megahertz. This one, a little bit tighter timings at cast latency 19. Uh, again, on the X299. This looks like it must be uh, a KB Lake X system, though, because the DIMM slots are only populated on one side. Remember, KB Lake X CPUs are dual channel memory. Uh, Skylake X CPUs are quad channel. So when you have quad channel, you're going to have memory on both sides. If you have KB Lake X and running dual channel, you're only going to slot in on one side of the motherboard. So that's kind of why they have this going on here. Next up here is the fastest kit they have currently running, at least with the 8GB by 2 configuration. 4800 megahertz, cast latency 19. Uh, it, it, everything that I'm telling you is validated by like what's up on the screens here. I'm not going to like show you guys the close-ups of everything, what's going on. Trust me, what, what G-Skill is showing is actually accurate here. This one, again, is running in dual channel mode, uh, but that, that's really fast, 4,800 megahertz, and already on Intel's newest line of CPUs. Uh, here's a 16 gig kit, and this time we're moving into the RGB memory. So remember, with RGB, uh, you can't, you're not gonna be able to hit quite as high frequencies, but you do get pretty colors, so you know, that's your trade-off. 4,000 megahertz, 16 gig, eight gigs by two kit, running at cast latency 18. Uh, Steve, I just want to point out. Hold on, Steve's here. Look, Steve came wait, in person. Wait, 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 wait. Uh, get the get the hair down, Steve. <laughs> Steve came in person to uh, say that he concedes uh, wait, to what? to my victory uh, in the overclocking challenge that G Skill uh, has going on right here. Uh, and how high did you go? We exactly we, we also have Der Bauer here to ver validate. He actually wasn't there, but um, but he, I'm just. And, and what was your overclock? Uh, Seven thousand seventy. Point one. Wow, that took a long time to come up with. Well, you make that up right now? No, in fact, I have a screen cap of it that I'm displaying on the screen right now just right, to prove right. that I'm not a liar okay. and that I am better at high, hardcore overclocking than you. Right, okay. Well, I have yeah. word from uh, Kyle that says otherwise. So. Moving on to here, we have several more kits. Uh, we're, this is the RGB stuff, so I kind of like this one. It's got, a, it's got a red, white, and blue theme going. America. I mean, I guess there's other countries that also use red, white, and blue. I'm getting distracted, though. Uh, this is a 64 gig kit, 8 gigs by 8 gigs, all populated in an X9, X299 Deluxe Asus Prime motherboard. This is running at 4200 megahertz. So again, with the RGB, that makes it uh, more of a challenge to run at high frequency, uh, but excellent that uh, G-Skill has a kit that is validated and working at that speed. Next up, we got a 32 gig kit. This is just 16 gigs by 2. So if you're uh, setting up a mini ITX board or something where your DIMM slots are a little bit more limited, you can still get your RGB and you can still make it really fast. Uh, with 4,000 megahertz, Castle NC 17, 18, 18, 38. Uh, that's an ASRock X299 OC formula motherboard in there, by the way. And finally, the fastest RGB DDR4 memory kits that anyone has, or at least G-Skill has. I mean, I would say anyone, because G-Skill usually has some of the fastest memory that's out there. This is a 16 gig kit, 8 gig by 2, 4,400 megahertz, cast latency 19, uh, 19, 19, 1939. And even though the memory is that fast, it still has RGB data going through it too. So that's pretty cool. Look, it's doing the flash and dash theme. Flash and dash, so much fun. A fast memory is awesome and all, but it's even more awesome if you have that fast memory in a Ryzen configuration. So here's a Crosshair 6 Hero with an AMD Ryzen 7 1700. This kit is at 3600 megahertz. AMD just recently launched a new AGISA, a new microcode for their Ryzen CPUs. Uh, the dividers go all the way up to 4000, but um, you know the memory manufacturers still need to work to get kits that are going to be validated to work with that. Uh, of course, uh, they've been a little bit finicky with the actual types of, uh, of ICs uh, that they're actually using, and Samsung B-Dies have been the most effective for Ryzen uh, processors. 3600 megahertz though at cast latency 16 is really, really fast, uh, especially in a Ryzen system. And uh, they also have this kit here, which is uh, 3466 cast latency 19, an eight gig by two kit. Uh, have I mentioned these are also RGB? They are also RGB, so that's cool too. Here's another 3600 kit at uh, cast latency 16 as well, eight gigs by two. Uh, this one is in a Gigabyte GA AX370 gaming K7 motherboard. And finally, down here on the end, a couple 3200 megahertz kits, both 8GB2, cast latency 14, 
Super tight timings on these, not quite as high a frequency, um, but 3200 MHz CL14 is uh, just is ripping fast for Ryzen. And um, of course, GSkill is working on getting these kits validated. What I was asking them is like, what kind of guarantee, if I got a Ryzen processor and I buy one of these kits, do I have that I'm going to be able to just plug in that speed and that uh, those timings and get the system to actually work? Uh, they said, you know, it's not 100%. Obviously, every CPU is a little different. The memory control in every CPU is a little different, so getting them to play nice together isn't always just going to be a plug-and-play sort of thing. But as the uh, micro-cut updates come out from AMD, and as G-Skill works on the memory kits and the modules that are in there and validates those, uh, you will have more options. And uh, what they did say is that in their experience, uh, if you have an X-series CPU, like a 1700X or an 1800X like we have right over here, they have said that those do seem to uh, play a bit nicer with the higher frequency memory. So if you are looking to get some high speed memory with the Ryzen platform, then maybe consider one of the x SKU CPUs uh, because the pricing for those, I mean, it's usually about 20, 30 bucks more, uh, at least for the 1700X over the 1700. And then the 1800X, of course, does have a price premium, but I have seen several sales on that too. So uh, there's, a little, there's a little bit more validity to getting the x SKUs. Let's finish off with some peripherals. We have Ripjaw's Mice over here. Now, uh, the one up on the top shelf there is the MX780, and that's actually been out for a little bit. You guys may have seen me talk about that one last year, actually. Uh, it's a really cool mouse. It's a little bit higher end, though, so uh, G-Skill's working on making mice that are a little bit more affordable. So for about 40 bucks, you can get this one here. That's the MX570. Uh, you'll notice it does have some LED lights on it. Actually, the LED around the back is blazingly bright, super bright. It's giving me halos as I'm filming and stuff like that. G-Skill did say that with the uh, the software, you will be able to adjust the brightness on that, so that's pretty cool. The MX570, though, does it's got an optical sensor, 7200 DPI. Uh, it's a right-handed design, but it does have Omron switches and six programmable buttons, and then, of course, that customizable RGB lighting. We'll store up to three profiles internally in the mouse, uh, and it comes with a braided cable. The MX530 is here. Again, this is only going to cost you about 30 bucks US. Uh, these are also uh, supposed to be relaunching uh, in Q3 of this year, so keep that in mind. They're not available quite yet. 3500 DPI sensor on this one. Again, a right-handed design, arm run switches. Uh, you get to store up to three pro profiles in this one as well. No braided cable, but you do get, again, a couple RGB accent lights with the G-Skill logo, as well as the scroll wheel. Let's talk keyboards next. Again, the one up on top is a KM780 RGB, and that one I have already discussed and shown you guys before. Look at my coverage from last year if you really want to take a closer look at that. They have a couple more coming out, though. The KM570 RGB is down here on the second level, uh, so the 570 is going to cost you not quite as much money. We don't have prices for these yet, but again, we should expect them in about the third quarter of this year, so not too far off. They are testing out some white options, so guys let uh, G-Skill know in the comments if a white version of one of their keyboards is something you'd be interested in. Uh, they might bring that to market. Uh, they do have at least a version of it here that they're showing off. These are all mechanical keyboards, of course, so they feature Cherry MX mechanical switches. They're available in blue, red, as well as brown. Uh, these here on the left that are RGB have per key RGB LED backlighting, and G-Skill also has a software suite that will allow you to configure that lighting to your preference. Now, down on the bottom, they have another version of these, and look how cute it is. These are 10 keyless, so uh, these are actually going to be known as the KM560 RGB. No 10 key on there, so a bit smaller, a bit more portable, and uh, just, a, you know, if you're really short on desk space, lots of people like 10 keyless options. Again, fully programmable. Uh, the software suite can help you adjust the RGB lighting on these and whatnot. Now, if you're not into those RGB options, uh, you do have a couple, uh, probably going to be slightly less expensive options over here, the KM570 MX and KM560 MX. Uh, basically exact same as far as functions and everything goes, except just red LED backlighting. And then here you're not going to be using software to configure stuff. Everything is uh, adjusted in, in, internally in the keyboard using the function button and the different buttons on top. And finally, here's the KM560 and KM570 just, just without any lights on them. It's weird. I feel weird being at G-Skill and finishing my G-Skill video on uh, stuff that doesn't have RGB lights on it. Lettering on all these is on the underside of each key, so uh, it keeps the top side nice and clean, with a nice clean look. And again, uh, they're considering a white option for this, as well as the black option. And again, available in 10 keyless and non-10 keyless options. 
So guys, that's gonna wrap it up for my coverage here at the G-Skill booth. Of course, I need to say a huge thank you to them for sponsoring my Computex 2017 coverage, as well as my other sponsors, EVGA, MSI, Tesoro, and Cooler Master. Of course, hit the thumbs up button and subscribe if you wanna see more. I'll be back with more Computex coverage coming soon, assuming I don't forget how to talk. See you then.